want to clarify one thing immediately. Uh, some people might think this is a drawing or a painting. Um, I tend to think of myself as a hybrid. And there are quite a few examples historically of artists actually working across mediums. And when I was in art school, I actually had a lot of trouble finding a language. We've just gone through the situation where you know trying to find a language for yourself. And I found painting actually quite problematic because it was very difficult to get a sense of a sound that you had ownership on. And when I was at art school in the late 70s, it's quite an interesting. I actually find art school fairly problematic because often you're pampering to a few teachers in the art school. And in those days, it was very much a minimalist period when I was there. So it was all um, sort of shaped canvases or stripes or you know, kind of constructivist sort of sculptural uh, pieces. And so I got caught up as a young artist in that aesthetic. So most of you probably know people like Frank Stella, American artist who did a lot of shaped canvases and stripes. The artist that I was actually particularly interested in was a guy called Michael Moon, who was um, prevalent in, in the 70s in, in the UK. So I spent a lot of time on the floor making very elaborate, uh, constructed, uh, shaped um, sort of forms, and then spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to put canvas around these shapes. So I actually had to go out and get seamstress to actually help me work out how to. So I actually got more preoccupied in, in the making of objects. Um, but curiously enough, that sort of constructivist thing, I think, has actually stayed with me all through my whole career. Because once I left art school, I, th I think one of the, the central problems is you can be quite a good student in an art school um, and, and do quite well. But I actually had very little emotional connection with what I was doing. So you actually go out and go into a studio situation on your own. I mean, half of what you do might, well, I mean, life to me always seems to be about having meaning or not having meaning, you know. So, in one sense, it's meaningless. So I've actually got to make it have meaning. Because half of you might look at this picture and say, well, it doesn't mean anything to you. But it has to mean something to me. So if I'm actually going to sit in the studio for days on end, and I have to find meaning in what I'm doing. And I actually discovered and realized that making shaped canvases was not really where I was at. And it's still sort of interesting. I, I, I think there's a, a lady called Louise Nelson, who was an American sculptor in the 70s, who used to make the comment to young artists that it's quite good to transplant. So you might transplant. You know, Stand in Torsten. I actually sort of transplanted from the UK to Australia, and I, just, I think that uh, complete change of culture and environment was the catalyst in which, when I landed in Sydney, I could actually remake myself, I could actually decide. And I actually went back to what I enjoyed before I went to art school, which was to, um, to draw. I used to do a lot of drawing before I went to art school. So, for the six or seven years of being in art school, I ended up uh, never going into a life room. You know, it's, kind of, it's like we used to think it was an anachronism to go and draw in a life room, you know, because we were modern artists and we were contemporary artists and moving forward. So, you know, drawing in a life room was, was considered really uncool. Yeah. So when you're 20, you know, you have to sort of go with the pack. You know. But it, it sort of, I sort of worked out eventually, you know, you had to be honest with yourself. And and so when I came out here, I actually just picked up a mirror and started drawing myself. And it was quite beneficial that I met Sue, that I just mentioned, within three weeks of being in Sydney. So it's a whole kind of destiny thing. I just think I was destined to actually stay here. Because I actually went and spent some time in America as well. But obviously, I didn't meet the right lady to stay here. You know, so. When it could have happened, but, you know, I mean, it would have been in America. I mean, ended up with somebody that part of the world, but anyway, I ended up here. But the supreme irony, of course, is that my dear wife actually was born in Guildford, which is about five miles away from Farnham, where I went to art school. <laughs> and when I actually went back to, to England, we discovered her brother and her parents lived just outside Canterbury, where I actually went to school. So when I actually went back to visit the folks, you know, her parents, 
a young married couple. You know, I actually walked from, from Herne Bay to Canterbury and peered inside my old art classroom at my prep school just outside Canterbury. So it's a very odd kind of journey and a kind of full circle thing. Um, but anyway, as I say, uh, I, when I came here, I started to draw and started to, to work with subjects and paint. Uh, a lot of the works in, in, in the 80s, I used to sort of tack the canvas onto boards. And it sort of ended up being a combination of, of sort of collage, um, paint, and pastel. And it, 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 just, just that kind of thing of mixed media just seemed to, to stay with me. But I actually found that probably most of the time I was in the studio, I probably spent 80% eight, eight, of my time making drawings for paintings. So around about 1995, I just sort of bit the bullet and said, well, really, I am a draftsman. I should really just go for what I was really comfortable with. And if you, interesting enough, the Dobell Drawing Prize, is they're doing a tour of this um, show about 20 years ago now. And if you actually go back and look at that early work of mine, the, one in 1999. It was actually mostly an etching with some drawing ink and pastel at the top. And it was clearly a very graphic work. Um, but from that point on, all the way through to the large works, if you do actually go down to the SHO, then you can see a, a much larger work that, that my wife actually in, in that show. And um, it's clearly a progression from a very edited sort of you know, clearly a drawing right through to the later works that start with a, a lot of paint and then it, 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 it's like any kind of art making, you, you never know, it's a kind of conversation between all those materials so sometimes the, the, the dry material might actually dominate or the wet material, you know, you never, it's never actually one or the other. And I'll let you guys um, have a look at these. Uh, they're just a quick series of sequences here, and you can see that at the early stages um, I paint out the image. Uh, I think paint is, and if anyone uses a lot of brush work, it's a, it's a much faster, quicker way of getting an image down. Um, and I, so I find that, the, that um, it's much quicker to sort of use the acrylic and the gouache and, and wet material to establish an image, and then I might actually work back into that with pastel or with charcoal or with other materials, and then it, it kind of moves between the two. But sometimes the image doesn't stick, so then it's a lot easier to paint out the image and start the process again rather than trying to rub something out or you know take it out. It's just just much faster. And I think that process of moving between having a conversation between the two materials is just I think it actually created an identity for my work. You know, people then associate that, you know, with that process, with, with, with the way that I might function. But you know, there's a lot of, lot of precedents if you think of Giacometti. I think most artists would be comfortable with the idea that some of us actually draw in paint. You know, like it's you, you can't really go past the Giacometti and not think about it in terms of drawing as well as paint. So I think it actually becomes a kind of a debatable thing. I mean, to me, at the end of the day, it's the validity of the image that matters. So you're going to kind of pick hairs about whether it's one thing or another. But I think you're actually missing the point. You know? like, it takes what it takes to make the image, and that's the way, that's my process. If you want to what, you challenge my process and say, well, I shouldn't do that because I'm cheating or something, I mean, it's ludicrous, really. You know, the image either stands up or it doesn't. And it has the combination of the two materials, and that's the way it's, you know, it's been for the last 15 odd years. Um, David, do you want to hand that, me to hand that around? Yeah. Um, just before I send this out, um, is James here? Has he disappeared on me? James, back to stand. I've actually asked James, who's my sitter, come. Uh, and James is a painter who lives in Glee. And he very kindly sat for me for about eight months. So this is actually just one work of a whole body of work that I uh, worked with him over the um, 
the eight months. So there's one, this work here is actually, um, there's a couple of progress shots of the work there. But I've also got on the next page, some of you might have seen the Archibald um, Prize, I don't know if you've seen that, but we've actually got a much bigger work of James in Thatcher, which is now travelling to Victoria, I think, or I think presently up at Newcastle. So you might actually like to see the way that that work also um, progress, and that's another one of James. So there's three big works there that you know you might just like to, to have a quick look at. So can you hold, make sure all those photos actually stay. Um, I do take, funny enough, I do take a lot of photos of my cities because it's always a way of just, you know, it's it's part of that conversation that you have. Uh, you can't hear me. Okay. I'll go back to my mic. Um, yeah, because one of the things that's quite important for me is, is the oral history of the cities, and clearly. I have a, a, a close relationship with all the sitters that, that come through my studio, and it's quite important that those sitters have something about them that is compelling and, and, and you know, fairly important in terms of my interest. And I, I just want to try and quickly just get across, because it's interesting, Francis Bacon, there's a show uh, that Tony Barnes is going to put on at the Art Gallery later this year, five decades, you may well know that that's coming on. And I've actually, they've asked me if I'd like to go and choose a couple of paintings down there and talk about it, because clearly I've got a fairly good sort of sense of Bacon in, in my own work as well as other artists. But the thing about Bacon, it's actually historically quite, also quite apt. So Bacon always talked about figuration from a point of view of a sensation. So you're never actually trying to illustrate the subject, you're trying to translate, trying to find an equivalent in terms of paint or pastel or whatever. And so I think, you know, when Bacon sort of threw paint at the, the canvas and then tried to sort of make something from that, there's that sort of alchemy where, where ultimately the image that you, t you would end up making on, on, on your canvas or paper is a real standalone image. It has no reference in terms of look, put. It's always about a mark that's an equivalent. Does that make sense? Maybe not, but anyway, I have to go to art school and have to these things out. But the, the sensation is, is actually quite important. So you're never actually um, you know, working from a photographic position. You're working really outside that um, I think that's one of the big challenges of actually working from subject, is, is not to copy, it's actually to find, find that sensation. You can actually talk, you know, go back and look at Vincent van Gogh, he actually talked about the same thing. So it's almost, it's kind of interesting, is that they actually talk a lot about building an image and actually totally destroying it or dismembering it and rebuilding it. So it's a constant reconstructing of that image to find what you think is an authentic position in that. And, and I think that's basically, you know, in an essence, what I'm trying to do with the sensation of having a sitter in, in the studio day after day, having those conversations. And so as James will attest, I actually then record or write out his whole history. And, um, and that's part of, part of the, the, the kind of dialogue that one has with the sitter. And some of you might like to, there's a book by a guy called Martin Gainsford who, who wrote a thing called the, the Man with the Blue Scarf, which is actually when he sat with Lucy Freud. And the Martin's actually the critic of the Guardian in London. So the, the book is really quite anecdotal and it goes off on lots of different tangents. It's very interesting because you know he talks about that relationship with the artist. And um, you know, it's quite compelling reading. There's another one James Lord did on Giacometti, which is another good book to get hold of if you're interested in that artist uh, subject relationship. Um, am, I, am I still here? Not fine. I find it hard to stop. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, maybe I should start asking for you guys to you know, come at me and give me a question. Or else I just keep talking. Anyone want to say something? Yep. Can we ask James what his view is on <laughs> James, do you want do you want to make a comment? I have a view. I'm just the sitter. Just the sitter. Not in my area, but no comment. <laughs> Gary, no, I do Gary Ray. Mark, Mark oh. Rothko, Mark Rothko sits. It has to be large for intimacy. It has to be large for intimacy. I suspect. I suspect you'd agree. Um, well, it's quite interesting because a lot of people think you know that the work is quite psychotic and generally seems quite busy. And in fact, when you actually look at most of my images, they're actually quite quiet and meditative. And I think um, Flanagan actually picked up on that same kind of quality. And I'm not actually sure that, that I'm really party to that. I just work with the sitter. And maybe it's probably to do with resolution, you know, how you spend a lot of time on a work but there's no resolution, you're just constantly moving stuff around to try to make it stick. And then once it starts to have resolution, maybe that slowing down process that happens to, it gets a bit tighter, perhaps a little bit more still. So maybe it's just in, in, in that particular sort of process. The scale is very important though, isn't it? Well, for me, you're right, because I live in Weber, which is south, southwest, now, I'm not actually very far from where you are, um, near Stanmore Tops, we're actually further down near Darks Forest on the other side, near, near Bulai. So it's a pretty rugged country down there. And when I moved out with Sue in 1987, we've got a five-acre block there in the studios and what have you, I actually tried to paint the landscape for probably the first four or five years and actually built a platform down our 50-metre gorge. Um, but it just looks a bit like Elizabeth Cummings or Fred Williams, you know, you just couldn't find your own thing. But the interesting thing was all that kind of calligraphic marking in that environment, I think it's actually impacted quite strongly on my work. And then I kind of hit on the idea if I actually scaled the work right up. And of course, the notion of actually using, I mean, this is slightly well, it's not unusual, it's just a progression from, you know, I spent 10 years on the head, I might as well start you know, trying to deal with the rest of the body, you know, do one thing at a time. So that idea of the scale is actually quite landscape oriented. You actually scan or um, across an image. And I would say most of my images are about the ability to get the wow factor from across the room, but also to be able to go up quite close and actually walk across the image and have that intimacy. So I, I think I quite enjoy that, you know, those two different sorts of decisions. I should come back to this fellow because you asked. Uh, I was interested in the highlighting using red. Why couldn't you have used yellow or green or something? Well, I could. could be <laughs> that could be another painting. Could. You know, it could be another image. I mean, one moves through, you know, it's like a musical thing. You can use through you know, a range of different scales, different moods. The red for me on an orange ground is always, you know, kind of, I think one thing that probably needs to be established here is that my, my conversation with history of art is, is probably really from a modernist position. I'm actually more interested in the 20th century, you know, artists like Bacon and Bruce Freud and Kossoff and, you know, Soutine and so on, and Kokoschka. So um, when, when people talk about what's a contemporary artist and a modernist, I tend to, I mean, I'm a contemporary in the sense that I work and operate in the 21st century, but my actual um, dialogue is actually with artists from that past period. And um, whereas probably a lot of contemporary younger artists would, would, would necess, you know, often be looking sideways, they'd actually be looking at um, phenomena that's actually happening around them, whereas I'm not actually that sort of, obviously, I go and look at shows and I'm interested in, in that, but my own work is actually quite rooted in that, you know, I'm more interested in you know, looking at Richard Dean Corn or looking at Francis Bacon and actually having a conversation. Going back to you know, Titian, 
um, Rembrandt, um, Goya. So that's my kind of sound, or the people that I that I would relate with. Is it difficult to know when you've finished? Well, when, when is it finished? Well, if, there's an interesting situation here because if you think of someone like Chuck Close, who's another, well, I mean, this sort of portrait painter or artist, um, by temperament, he actually brings the work up and he'll start in one square and move through. So by the time he's got to number eight, clearly he's, the process is finished. Whereas if you ask the Cooney when his painting's finished, or well, we know sometimes it went on for two years and you never figure it out. So it's a kind of temperamental thing. I think some artists need the certainty of a system. And you know, you see that quite often in contemporary art, you know, where people set up projects or set up pieces and then actually make the work because that's a clearly defined process. But certainly with, with work like this, it's very hard to know exactly when, when you're going to finish it. But I, I think I've got this experience. I think you know, and we've talked about the sensation. I've got this sitter with me the whole time. And clearly when you're working at, on equivalence, sometimes the, the, the audience might not actually see the relationship. And there's a guy called Ewan Nudler, another well-known English painter, who, who actually made the comment, it's not like but right, you know, it's not the likeness that's necessarily the crucial thing, it's the rightness. So you look at this, you, that's why I call them by initials, because I'm not that interested in you saying, oh, that looks like James. But I actually wanted to kind of challenge you on that one, say, well, actually, while that's not my, my um, intention, I'd rather you looked at the work, got something from it emotionally, and not say, well, that, no. so it looks like James, okay, you, you must know how to you know, make this image. That's not what I'm interested in, but, but, but I still maintain that there is a connection. And um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, I think when you're working on, on, on a series of works, uh, it's, it's, you, you've got a lot of um, work on the go. And I think they kind of have conversations with each other. So you start to get a sense of the ones that are further ahead in terms of resolution. Very hard to just do one work and actually get a sense of whether that's a finished work. I, I have to work, and that's why in some cases with the one or two sisters, I've worked for anything up to two years on, if I can persuade them to keep them. I feed them well, I give them good lunches. Occasional wine, you know, make the whole day at least enjoyable and it's a lovely environment. But occasionally, when things get slightly dodgy, then I have to go to Sydney and, and sit with you know, in their studios or their spaces. Yes, hello there, congratulations. Thank you. On your win. And I just want to, obviously, you have a career behind you and obviously you have a career ahead of you, but somebody like <laughs> so that's a bit dodgy. <laughs> no, I think she's a her own person. I don't think she needs me to you know, put a critique on it. That would be demeaning, I think. <laughs> I could say one thing, which is just part of a, a general um, idea. I mean, with, with Clara, it's quite interesting when you're using these these slabs of paint, there's clearly a kind of an abstraction. So it's actually not that different. You see, when I work a lot with the linear thing, line, line is actually quite abstract in the sense if you, if you think of a building without cladding, you know, it's just a skeletal structure and the air can actually move through the, 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 the object. Uh, as soon as you start to clad a building, it starts to become quite representational. So I'm actually quite, um, the reason I'm there a lot in my work is to keep that air and oxygen in the work and to keep it abstract and keep it not forming up into some sort of representational, does that make sense? So I think the same thing happens with 
with your work, you know, when you're actually using slabs of material, you're, you're very um, conscious of the physicality of the slabs of paint that then kind of, if you like, metamorphosize into the image. So then it becomes quite clear that the, the, the relationships between those abstractions actually coalesce into an image. So I think we're just different kinds of painters, processes are different, but at the end of the day, the conceptual framework isn't that far apart. That makes sense. I mean, in my case, I prefer to be able to scan find lots of things that that then relates to the association with landscape. In your case, the, the work is really quite upfront and quite confrontational about this in Ben Quilty's work. Um, so if I was to make an opinion and it just becomes a matter of choice and temperament, I, I prefer to be able to kind of get in behind the skin. But, you know, it's, 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 it's it's like saying, well, you know, sure, I could have made a yellow painting, but I chose to make a red one, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Is that enough? Do you think I'm overdoing it? Like Jack and Betty, you attempted to go to sculpture, or have you? And is it, you have a series, but is it hard not to get distracted to go and do other things? Yeah, well, I do a lot of printmaking. Mm -hmm. And, um, the printmaking side of it is, is, is a newer thing because it's just taken me about 10 years to actually get on top of it. And it's, it's the same thing, if you, you know, when you go into a new medium, the actual process of printmaking is not that difficult. You know, put it in an acid bath and make a print, what have you. But to sort of claim ownership of that process is much harder. And I found that I've actually worked with master printers over the years and, and other printers or other printmakers have said, oh, I much prefer your prints because they're more feral, they're less certain, you're not actually sure of the process. And so you're really kind of in there like you with, with your major works where you're scrubbing and scratching and rebuilding and what have you. Um, but it just took a long time to, to, to get to a point where, you know, the works started to uh, have their own identity. And I've actually just got uh, an Australian Print Commission. So I sort of feel it's like you, you know, I feel like, you know, not part of the printmaking fraternity, but I've got my own press and my own setup because I actually decided that I wanted to have that as a, as a parallel process. I think the thing about sculpture or printmaking is the, is the, is the time. I mean, it's clearly a lot quicker to just get out your brush and go for it, and I could do 10 works in a week. Well, not really, but, you know. <laughs> uh, or at least start 10 works, but to do 10 uh, etchings in a week would be pretty hard to, to act well, at least get them to any sort of standard of resolution. Um, but basically, you know, I got to a point after my survey show that I actually wanted to, to, to do some prints on the same size as my, my drawings and paintings, or hybrids, whatever you want to call them. And that will be something that I want to get more involved in. Yeah. So I was always going back to, to these works and the etchings. Um, but it's kind of nice having to here. I mean, I'm, I work on a lot of, you know, a lot of things. I've got all the big works, got the etchings, small studies, because I do a lot of pen and ink gouache studies for things as well. So like, like the sculpture, <coughs> I just haven't got my head round sculpture clay, but clearly I, I could. But it's it's this priority. What what how much I mean I think my own temperament is actually more like a hedgehog. You know, I dig down into one burrow and hopefully strike a bit of water. Whereas someone like my wife Sue, she's more like a fox. You know, like a so metaphorically speaking, she's into lots of different orifices. <laughs> but, um, but she works sculpture, you know, printmaking, painting. She she's extraordinarily diverse. But of course, it's also can in some cases be fragmented. Um, so I tend to want certainty, so I just keep plodding away, and hopefully something. It's like anything, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you spend enough time with someone, 
you know, you move past that first impression and they, it either becomes a deeper thing or you suddenly realise they're bullshit artists. You, know, you start to realise that they haven't got the substance. So this whole facade that we run around with needs to be broken down. You can only do that over time. And I think it's the same with our new artworks. You can hit, hit the deck running. You think, gee, this, she, she or he looks great. Wow. And then after a couple of weeks, you start to realise just what a trip you've been on. You know, you've got to kind of move past that and actually get some authenticity. So there's all these kind of things that are going on in, in your work as well as with your people you're meeting to, to get past all that uh, front. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting sort of journey. Really. Okay. Well, thank you, David. Yeah, thank you very much.